We are about to begin another episode of the Prosperident webinar series. From their unique perspective as dentistry's embezzlement experts, Prosperident's team brings you information you will not find anywhere else. Now sit back and relax while Prosperident's Amber Weber, Wendy Askins, and David Harris address the issues that are important to you. Hello, dental family. Thank you for joining us this evening. We appreciate you taking your time to continue learning about this epidemic of embezzlement that is just engulfing dentistry. We have an ab some absolute first this evening for you. Not only do we have a courageous victim who's going to be telling us his story this evening, we also have the contrast of having a video, which you just watched in the pre-show, of uh, the suspect uh, who committed the embezzlement. And the contrast in their stories is absolutely shocking, to say the least. Also, we have another first because we are focusing on some of the work that was done by our amazing dear friend, Amber Weber Gonzalez. So we're happy to focus on that. So let's get some boring housekeeping stuff out of the way first. Number one, we're gonna be here for about an hour and a half. And for those of you who've joined us before, you know that Dave is pretty much a stickler on the, on the time frame that we have, although I'm sure we'll have tons of questions. This session is going is being recorded and it will be posted on our website and on our YouTube channel uh, sometime between Friday and Monday. So if you enjoy this uh, webinar, which I have no doubt you're going to, you enjoy this webinar, please share it with your friends and have them visit either our website or our YouTube channel um, to take a look at it. Also, we are providing um, continuing education credit for this evening, thanks to Altura Periodonics. And directly after this webinar concludes, you'll be receiving an email, um, which will tell you exactly how to obtain your CE certificate. So with that boring housekeeping stuff taken care of, Dave, take us away. Wendy, you could make the firm news sound interesting. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I, just before we, we start tonight, I just want to give um, our audience a little preview of what we're going to be doing next month. So our date next month is November 15th. And as usual, we're going to start at 8 p.m. We have a really interesting guest. His name is Emmett Scott. Emmett is, uh, first of all, the CEO of a, of a dental support organization called Community Dental Partners. He's also the president of an, uh, of an organization called the Association of DSOs. And Emmett's going to talk to us about something that I think is on the mind of a lot of practitioners, which is like, what's it like to work in, with a DSO? Um, he also hosts a, a Facebook group that does a podcast called DSO Secrets. I, I've known Emmett for a number of years. He's a, he's a terrific guy. He's very uh, upfront about the DSO world. And if you have any kind of curiosity at all about how DSOs work or what it would be like if, if you were to affiliate with one, uh, I can't think of a better guy than Emmett to answer those questions. So he's going to be with us next month. Um, I, I think it's going to be a, a, a terrific learning experience, and I can't wait. Great. That's going to be so exciting. I'm always excited about the things that we learn um, in our great webinars. Well, this is an exciting night for me. It's near and dear to my heart. This was a very challenging um, and interesting case that I completed um, approximately two years ago. Um, there were so many multifaceted things that came up in the case, but one of the main things is the client that I worked with, Dr. Mark Saladin, he was truly an inspiration in many ways while I worked on this case. Uh, he was always great to communicate with. Um, I can just really honestly tell that he was in dentistry for the right reasons and truly cared about not just his patients, but those who he felt were his dental team. And so that's why I think this story is so important to share to those who are in the dental industry, because I think all of us enter this profession realistically with a sense of compassion for others. Absolutely. And so realizing that 
and and communicating with him and developing such a great relationship with him um, has been so inspirational in so many ways. And I I really think, especially for new and upcoming dentists and dentists who have that sense of compassion, it's really going to help you understand what dentistry truly is about and how important it is to learn other aspects that you don't think will occur in your practice. Well, welcome, Mark, and thank you for coming on with us and sharing your story. I, I will mention that uh, Mark is at his um, fishing cabin tonight, as as the uh, display behind him might uh, might indicate. And I tried tried to find a quiet corner. Perfect. So what what we did is we've pre-recorded Mark a, a couple of weeks ago, just telling about what happened to him. We're going to play those videos, but of course, he's also with us live. And we weren't sure if he would have a good enough internet connection tonight, but it looks like he does. Yeah. He he also uh, graciously came on live. So we'll probably have a little bit of discussion as well. Um, we're going to start with with what was in the media about his situation. Let's uh, let's watch that first. An office manager for a Carthage dentist is accused of stealing tens of thousands of dollars from her employer. Authorities say from 2017 until January of 2020, Miranda Wolf failed to deposit nearly $60,000 in cash the customers had paid to the dental firm where she worked. She's also accused of increasing her pay by more than $44,000 in 2019 and 2700 in 2020 and using the company credit card to make more than $27,000 in unauthorized payments. Authorities have charged Wolf with three counts of stealing more than $25,000. All right, well, let's, uh, let's hear from the recorded Mark. Yeah. And we had hired an office manager who actually started out as a dental assistant and worked in the practice for 25 years and had been office manager for approximately four or five years. And we, she had complete trust. Um, we, uh, you know, for example, the previous dentist had gone to, you know, church with her grandparents, knew her parents. I knew her parents. Uh, she uh, had been a patient in the practice uh, as a child. Um, and, uh, you know, knew her family, uh, she's well respected in the community, um, just had complete trust. So, um, that's why she ended up with the job. She really didn't have the educational background for it, but we trained her and she really got the job because we thought we could trust her. You know, this was a person that had, her husband was a, was a friend of mine, her she was friends with my wife, with my family, uh, helped, uh, helped with my daughter's wedding. Um, you know, there were a lot of, a lot of things that she had done, uh, as, as what we felt like friendship. Um, you know, everybody loved her, you know, and the patients all loved her. We hear that story a lot. Yep. So that this person kind of becomes part of your family. And I'm, I'm not sure it's it's accidental or it's done for other reasons. I mean, Mark, you certainly had that feeling about her. Um, yeah, I, uh, I was bought in, you know, I bought into the, to her and her uh, story, you know, completely. Uh, the, one of the dis, disheartening parts is after we, uh, after this came out, you know, people would come to me and say, would say things like, well, you know, we knew certain things were going on and then we knew that you weren't aware of it, but we didn't think you'd believe us. And, uh, um, you know, that, that was a little disheartening to, you know, that people didn't feel like they would could come and tell us that. And that's just kind of the power she had over people. She was, she was really good at, um, um, manipulating herself, putting herself in a position where she had people, uh, Feel like she was helping them um and sometimes she did but sometimes she just led others to believe she was doing all these things for other people when she really wasn't 
Uh, one interesting thing that I learned, Mark, during the um, investigation is how active she was in the community. I mean, that's one thing you really opened my eyes with. I mean, from the agriculture world and, and many things like that. I mean, she was very active in the community as well. Right. Um, one thing that that uh, I, I don't think I'd ever shared that I, you know, looking back was very odd. She would have these really close friendships uh, and they'd be, you know, real intense friendships with another family. And then it was just like she dropped them cold turkey. Uh, and, the, and I can name, you know, four or five uh, people like that. Um, you know, and looking back, that's a little odd. Uh, you know, she, she didn't have those long term, uh, you know, close friends. Um, I mean, she, she did one or two, but, you know, she would have these, you know, uh, be super active with a with a family, go to their, you know, be involved with their kids, uh, sporting events, um, maybe going to church with them. Uh, and then it would always be, well, she, you know, did something to upset her or she, uh, you know, she always had an excuse for why they, it was their fault that they weren't friends anymore. But now that I look back at that, that's kind of a, maybe a warning sign a little bit that she was, uh, maybe not always in it for the right reasons. So that's a really good observation. Yeah. Uh, so one of the most interesting things about what we're about to share here is when I first started the investigation and Mark and I were communicating really regularly, um, Miranda was no longer uh, working in the practice. How, she was branching out into other aspects of dentistry. Um, but Mark had reached out to me and said, you know, she she wants to know where we're at, how much you found. And, and there was this constant urgency from her to communicate with us. And so Dave uh, finally came up with the idea that we need to give her the offer to complete a video um, confession with us so that we could understand the true meaning by, by what she had done. Because at the beginning of the investigation, just like Mark is saying, um, she was considered part of the family. And so there was some serious, um, questions about why did she do it? We trusted her. I mean, she could have moved into our house if she was in an emergent situation. So that was what we're about to share here now is um, what really shows a different mindset of what a lot of people would think would happen versus what actually happened. I mean, I, I was married to a man for 20 years and he was, you know, I was just trying to keep somewhat of a peace through the marriage and it got to where I didn't have funds available through him um, to maintain the lifestyle that we had created for our family. She's a very charismatic uh, person and she uh, was very good at manipulating people. And I, I don't think she thought that we would uh, pursue it. I don't think she thought we would uh, try to get her money back or anything like that. I think she was just trying to get what she could and move on. And I don't feel like there's, I, I think this is all just, how can I get out of this the easiest way? Um, she's completely abandoned her children. Um, I say completely, I mean, I, I'm sure she has some, some kind of uh, 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 contact with them, but she, she walked out of the situation she was in with her husband and and left her kids. So uh, if it had been uh, as bad as she she portrayed it, I don't think she would have uh, left her kids. And and she did move in with another person after that. You know, the items that were stolen were not items that you needed desperately to get away from your husband. She was so well loved and and thought of in the community, there was a lot of people that would have helped her both physically and financially get away from a bad situation and her kids, if that was really the situation. Mark, I always wanted to ask you, which we never, we got to uh, ask this question, but during the time that she was still working for you and um, the embezzlement was occurring, did it ever appear to you that she was struggling as far as like financially or wasn't able to go do things she enjoyed or did, did anything like that ever? No, not at all. Um, she, during the time that she was embezzling, I believe uh, 
they had a, uh, a, a farm animal that won the state fair. I mean, was a grand champion of the Missouri State Fair. So, uh, you know, they were able to attend, they were able to go and do all those things. Um, and just like always, I mean, I don't believe there was ever uh, anything that she did without. Okay. Her husband has, had a really good job. I mean, it wasn't, you know, I mean, he, he, uh, he had a good job. He made good money. And then when we finally uh, decided she wasn't doing a very good job, there were some other problems. She was going through a divorce, uh, but we did make a decision that we were going to kind of take some of the responsibilities away from her because we didn't feel like the jobs were getting done like they should be. And uh, we um, ended up, uh, we were going to, take her, her salary, she was a salaried employee and make it back to a hourly wage. Well, anyway, when we did that comp, you know, computing, we double checked it with the accountant, the accountant ran some figures and said, no, uh, everything is, is uh, way off. And uh, we came to the conclusion that what we thought we were paying her around 60,000 plus a, uh, a bonus was actually somewhere in the six digits. That is abso absolutely stunning. <laughs> uh, I'm so sorry. And I, I'm, a, yeah. I'm about a slide behind, Mark. But one thing I wanted to ask you, um, which I, I think I know the answer, but I, I just want to make sure I point this out, is that you seem like a really genuine, caring, and kind person. Mm -hmm. If she had come to you and she had said, doctor, I'm really struggling. I'm in a really bad place in my life and I need some help. You probably would have freely helped her. Well, I, I think we uh, discussed this at one point, but um, I actually had gone to my wife uh, at one point and talked to her because I had drank the Kool-Aid, as I'd like to say, uh, believed everything she said, and I thought that her husband Greg had had uh, you know become this monster she was describing. And I'd actually gone to my wife. We have a big basement. Our kids have moved out. I'm like, you know, she could. I, I said, would you have a problem with us uh, having her over to the house and and staying in our living in our basement with her children to get away if she needs? Because he would never think to come and check our house, and she could park her car in the garage, or be, you know have no idea that she was there and my wife was on board and I had even told her that uh, but prior to that getting to that stage I had encouraged both of them to see marriage counselor um, I had you know offered to pay for it uh, you know I I really was hoping that that they could work it out wow. that, that's way above and beyond and I, I'm just so sorry this happened to you so yeah, I was I was completely blindsided by it. I had no idea that she had this uh, dark side or this alter ego, so to speak, uh, that uh, uh, you know, uh, that, you know, if we, some if we'd known some of those things, we probably would not have put her in a position of of trust. Uh, but we weren't aware of it. You know, she she volunteered at church at the in the nursery. She. Uh, her husband had a, a, a very high uh, administrative job in, in our community, in the, in the high school. Um, he, uh, you know, they were well connected. They, they uh, you know, she was always doing something for somebody else. And then, then I bring that up to some people and they're like, well, she said she did that, but she maybe didn't do everything she said she did. Yeah, that, that's what's interesting through our conversations, um, Mark, during the investigation when we would talk about things that she had over-promised and under-delivered even in the practice, right? Right. So right. Getting patients in for treatment. Um, sounds like even in the community, she she volunteered to do things that didn't happen. 
Well, and, and it, had, it seemed like it got worse. You know, I think early on, she maybe followed through with things. When I say early on, I'm talking 10, 15 years ago. Uh, and then just as time went on, um, she she just wasn't the same person, you know, look at hindsight, you know, looking back on it now, I can see that. But at the time, uh, he thought, well, she's just going through a rough time. She's just got to, you know, work through these issues and then she'll, she'll be back to herself. But, um, and her, her father had passed away and, and I, and I don't know if this is on one of our, uh, clips, but she, uh, I felt like she would always maintained a certain, uh, you know, appearance in the public and in our community as long as he was alive because she wanted him to be proud of her. But it was when he passed away, I think that that kind of went away. And so she didn't really care anymore. To me, the takeaway here for, for Dennis in the audience is we should never confuse um, kind of overt displays of religion or community involvement um with with displaying that the underlying person is fundamentally good no i i think that's uh, absolutely true and i mean you know it happened here but I, i've seen it happen in other situations as well i mean um and and i'm not uh, obviously that's not always the case but <laughs> but no, you, you know the fact that somebody spends their sunday mornings at church um doesn't mean they're not an embezzler and you know to me that's that's one of the things miranda displays very clearly mm -hmm. absolutely we even hired an accountant to come in and uh, work with her because we thought maybe she was not inputting the numbers correctly or if there was a you know some kind of another issue and and he worked with her several times and he you know he's like no we got it uh taken care of i think she's on track now and uh, he was completely uh, uh, fooled by her as well. One thing I want to add here, Mark, that really my first conversation with you, um, when you shared with me that you and the other associate doctor that you um, were partners with, that the excuses that you were given um, as to why things were not adding up from Miranda were things like you, you know, health issues, you had carpal tunnel surgery, there's a lot of things that happened that she had used and, and turned to make it seem like, well, that's why our numbers are a little off. Well, and, and that is one thing I'd, I'd like to, to point out. Um, and I, I, again, we, we talked about this. I don't know if it's on one of the clips, but we, uh, uh, we were going through a pretty tough time. Uh, my, my business partner and I uh, both had uh, very tough years. The, the, main, the main year that most of the uh, embezzlement occurred, uh, I'd had bilateral carpal tunnel and, and ulnar nerve release surgery. I was out of the office for six, eight weeks. Uh, he was out of the office for nine weeks. He has a special needs son and he required surgery at a children's hospital in Houston. And so we were really leaning on her to try to take care of things and and we we didn't go follow through with our due diligence with our reports and things like we normally had been doing uh but she uh and we did notice that the numbers were off we noticed that the uh, uh things were not adding up correctly and we pointed out but she always had a always had a, an excuse she always had uh, an answer and uh and so again we trusted her so we we didn't question it and 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 we were really stressed at that point. Embezzlers seek out vulnerability. Mm -hmm. They, you know, they pounce in a situation when they know that because of what else what else is going on in your life, you've kind of taken your eye off the ball. Right. When and when the you know the accounts receivable were a lot higher than what they had been in years past. I mean, there was excuses like, well, we've had an awful lot of write-offs too this year, you know, then and uh uh the, you know the numbers are not adding up because you, you guys haven't been in the office. Um you know, just uh, and then there was another excuse that uh she had a separate computer that she did had reports that had been uh, set up by a previous office uh, consultant we had, 
Uh, and she said that computer crashed. So the numbers haven't been right since that computer crashed. And that made absolutely no sense. But, uh, you know, we, we were like, well, OK, well, we'll get we'll get someone to help you figure it out. And that's part of when we brought in the accountant was to to help try to you know, bring that together so that we could get our our reports, uh, the numbers making more sense because we did know that something was off. Well, I remember in the first conversation that you and I had, um, and you said to me, you know, okay, my partner and I were both off for various times and now our accounts receivables gone through the roof. And I said, Mark, that, you know, that makes no sense. Right. I mean, if your productivity was down, you know, my, my expectation would be that your AR would, would follow it downward and not kind of go in the opposite direction. And yeah, I, you know, I remember you and I talking about that and we, we agreed, you know, that just it, it, what, what she's saying to me doesn't line up with what the numbers are showing. And that's, that's really when we started to think about digging in a bit deeper. Right. And before you called us, you went to the police. Had, um, gone and spoke, uh, to our local, uh, law enforcement, uh, police department. Um, and we just didn't really feel like the, uh, the smoking gun wasn't really there to, to, for them to be able to do much about it. And, uh, we needed somebody with, uh, expertise, uh, to be able to put together a case because, uh, the, the police department just didn't have the uh, background or, or the ability to, uh, to do that. Yeah. Mark really says here, what I've said for many years, the police can't solve this crime. They just can't. No. And, uh, again, it's a small community and, uh, not a lot of resources as well. They, they took the computer and sent it off for computer forensics. Um, we never got it back in time for it to matter. And I don't know that there was ever anything found on it. Uh, but it was gone for several months. Um, and, and by that time, I think uh, uh, Prosperident had a pretty good handle on it. Um, so, yeah, uh, there's, there's, there's no way that it would have progressed the way that it did without a re the report that we received. I'm very confident of that. Thank you. I'm pretty confident that had we not had Prosperident, uh, our case would have just been lost. But the fact that we had a, such a good case, I, I think they knew they had to do something with it. David, I, he's the first one I spoke with and he was, uh, I called and left a message and I, I can't remember exactly what I said, but it was probably a kind of a mic drop moment for him. He's like, oh, and he immediately called me back. He pretty much told me it wasn't my fault. He's very gracious in that way. Uh, he says, this happens, this happens to people. Um, and, uh, you know, it isn't that you did anything wrong. All you did was trust somebody. Uh, it went, uh, you know, they gave us a timeline and I feel like you guys met the timeline. Uh, and, and you did come to me and say, hey, I think there might be some more here if I dig a little bit more, uh, but I'm going to need a couple more weeks. And we were like, Hey, go for it. And, and you did. Uh, and, uh, I thought that was, was great. Yeah. I, I, I felt very good about the whole team. Uh, and I keep bringing up Amber. She was our, our main point of contact. I, th I feel, and she worked with a couple other members in my, in our, in our staff. Um, and, uh, uh, Anyway, I, I, there was a there was a whole team effort. It wasn't just one person. Absolutely, we 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 chose to go with Prosperident because our accountant was trying to uh, put some things together. But we just, uh, my partner and I, we we pretty much determined that uh, we didn't have a smoking gun. We didn't have direct tie uh, with what we were presenting. And so uh, we went to the experts and uh, uh, Amber was able to take um, the, uh, we used uh, EagleSoft and she was able to uh, go through our EagleSoft accounts and actually find those smoking guns.
One thing I want to add here, Mark, is I did have interaction with your staff, and it was pretty amazing how um, they were 100% behind you, the, the ones that I talked to, and truly value um, how well you were to work for, and uh, truly what a, what a great dentist you were. So that, that was very enjoyable. Um, and the minute I'd ask for stuff, you and the staff would just respond immediately. That's important. Yeah, it, it was very important. Well, uh, Rhonda didn't just hurt the owners. She hurt uh, the staff of the team. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't feel like doctor, the other doctor and I were stolen from. They felt like they were stolen from. Mm -hmm. And uh, the patients, the patients loved her as well. And uh, uh, everybody, you know, took it to heart. And that was that was very noticeable during the investigation. I mean, it, it was very well known that everybody was 100% on your side and, and wanted some justice. So here's where we get into he said and she said. <laughs> and I, I kind of laugh at this because whenever I speak and I talk about what people confess to versus what they really do, I've, I've said for many years that on average a thief confesses to one sixth of what they've actually stolen. Uh, so let's watch Miranda first and then, and, and then Mark and uh, do the math. I do not, 25 maybe. So Miranda says 25,000, mm -hmm. let's, let's find the truth. The total, the total amount was 154,000. Yes, it was a little shocking that it had added up to that amount, but uh, it looks like uh, the way everything has gone through that there's a good chance that we're going to recover most of it. So yeah. 20, 25,000 times six, 150,000, what was stolen was 154. Yeah, my number is looking pretty good right now. Yeah. You know what I also found very interesting about this uh, video confession with Miranda is that um, Having worked working closely with Amber, I could tell during the interview that she was asking specific questions, and I knew Amber knew the answer because I know what a thorough investigator she is. <laughs> and then Miranda would either say, "No, I didn't do that," or "I don't remember." And I, you know, I I just thought to myself, and I talked to Amber about it later. And I said, you knew exactly what she had done. I mean, we're not gonna talk about it now because we're not gonna talk about specific death methodologies in public, but I was like, you knew exactly what you were asking her. You knew what was driving that question from the methodology that she had done. And she sits there and denies it. We're gonna play in a few minutes, uh, what I call the Alzheimer's slide. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and that's, you know, all the little clips of her memory failing her, and there are a lot of them. There was, I mean, there was no question when I brought that forward and, and I sent a copy to our local law enforcement and our uh, prosecuting attorney um, that that she was guilty. I mean, there, you know, it was, uh, it was all the, all the lines were connected to all the dots and, and, uh, you know, it was a direct correlation between who was making the deposits, when the deposits were made, when, what day it was, what day the deposit, the amount the deposit should have been, and what when it actually went in the bank. I mean, our accountant, who is a really good accountant, had gone through and he had, well, I have this amount and this amount, and I know these aren't the same, but he, he didn't have that. He couldn't take that program and, and, and the bank statements and correlate them. He, he didn't have the expertise with the dental software to be able to connect it all together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I, um, I actually have two cases in federal court right now in Houston. And I'm working with um, the assistant U.S. attorney um, who's prosecuting both cases by the same woman, of course. So she's a serial embezzler just going around hitting offices in Houston as fast as she can, stealing. I mean, th this last case I worked on, she was up to $26,000. And she worked there six months. 
Um, <laughs> anyway, um, but that is exactly what the Secret Service agents um, had told me and what the Assistant U.S. Attorney had told me was that our report just put everything together for them because they understand they understand theft, mm -hmm. but they don't understand dentistry. They understand theft methodology, but they don't know how it's done within the dental office or the different types of payment methods or payment offerings from insurance companies. They don't understand that. So it, it's, you know, kind of like you said, Mark, it, the first time you went to the police, they're like, mm, we can't really do anything with this. But then you take them back a report and it just lays it out beautifully and in layman's terms for them exactly what happened, when it happened, a master list of losses, which is like every single transaction that theft touched um, and all the inf information that they need. So well, and I, you know, it's easy to just go get a subpoena. <laughs> yeah, well. Yeah. The, the the one point I, I would make when we when we went to the law enforcement, what's really scary is it wasn't that they didn't say they couldn't do something with it. It was that they looked at it and almost acted like, well, we just need more information. We need more information. And we just deduced from the conversation, hey, they're not going to be able to do this. They don't they don't understand what really happened. And the, the, the advice that I'll give to the audience is. A mistake we see a lot is people confuse somebody who knows 20% more than they do with an expert. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, sometimes people will go to their accountant or, um, you know, they'll go to the police and they'll kind of get the cold shoulder from one of those and then they just give up. And the thing that Mark did that, that ultimately produced a good outcome was he, he, he didn't take no for an answer from them. He said, all right, we just need to move this up the food chain and, and, that's kind of where we came in. And after that, all the, all the other parties could do their jobs. My motivation was more, uh, let's not let this happen to someone else. Uh, and if we were lucky and got 25 cents on the dollar, uh, that would be, you know, about what I would expect. I, you know, I wasn't really, you know, uh, I really wasn't expecting a whole lot as far as financial recovery, you know. Um, but uh, it looks like uh, the way everything has gone through that there's a good chance that we're going to recover most of it. You know, that's one of the big myths. A lot of people think I won't see any money from this. Mm -hmm. And almost everybody we work with gets back more money than they expected to. And, and that certainly seems like the case here. Mm -hmm. You know, the sentence that she got was somewhat tied to a payment uh, schedule so that in, if she doesn't follow through with some of this, she's she's looking at having all the charges brought back. So uh, she's got a lot of motivation to, to get it paid back. Yeah, we're increasingly seeing judges incentivize people to pay back. Um, I saw a case we were involved in a little while ago, and somebody got sentenced to five years in jail. However, if they paid the money back, they didn't do the jail time. What happened? I mean, they went to their father, you know, their their rich uncle, whatever, and they borrowed the money and they made the payment and they they stayed out of jail. Yeah. Um, and from the doctor's perspective, you know, that was um, the number involved was about three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So. You know, that's 350 crowns he didn't have to do to put himself in the same place in terms of retirement. Well, and, and one thing that I think, Mark, during our conversations during and after the investigation, um, that was a little bit of closure for you, is you knew Miranda was branching out into other aspects of dentistry. And and I think now with what happened, you, you've helped prevent pot, hopefully other practices or or other things being taken advantage of by her because it is. <laughs> yeah, the, the, she she had been uh, well trained. She had been trained by a national. Uh, I mean, most people would probably know her name if I if I said it. I'm not going to, but uh, a national, well respected uh, practice consultant, 
and uh, she had taken that stepping stone and and moved it moved it to a position where she could potentially be a practice consultant. And she and I can't remember the name of the the company. I wouldn't want to say it either. But she had her her picture posted on a on a website and was was promoting herself as a dental uh, consultant. So she was just uh, um, trying to. She she was very good at the lingo. She was very good at the the verbiage. Good, like I said, she's good at manipulating people. And and uh, she would she could you know get herself in a position to 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 steal again. Yeah. So she she was hired by a a a, a big well known dental consulting company. Uh, when Mark told us about that, I. You know, I know the company fairly well. I made a phone call and said, you know, you might want to just double check this one before you you do anything else. And and Miranda's picture was on their website. You know, it was uh, it it was a done deal. But when they heard from us, they they undid it very quickly. Yeah, uh, and and you know responded one hundred percent properly. But yeah, you know, it was it was entirely possible that she took the um, skills, shall we say. That she was applying in Mark's office, and you know, suddenly had a chance to do it in twenty different offices. Right. So, you know, that would have that would have been like the, the like the fox having sole possession of the keys to the hen house. Um, and and I'm glad we all stopped that. Yeah. Well, we've talked about money and you know what's happened there. Of course, something I think the audience wants to know is how do you feel when all this is happening? And and I I really um, liked what Mark said here. I mean, the message might not be what everybody wants to hear, but um, the way you described the experience emotionally, Mark, in the, in the video that's coming up, I think was, was uh, really instructive. That's the worst part uh, for me. Um, I've been uh, practicing for 32 years. Uh, I love being a dentist. Um, I have always been passionate about uh, taking care of my patients. It took some of the steam out of my uh, uh, sales, so to speak, uh, in practicing. You know, I I was always proud to own a dental practice. I always uh, uh, took pride in that, and I just kind of lost that desire to for ownership anymore. And so since since then, I have uh, sold. Uh, my half of the practice to my partner and I'm a independent contractor now and I've cut back on my days. Uh, I'm still seeing my patients. I'm still taking care of them. I'm still keeping uh, my staff members that I've worked with uh, for so long employed. That's important to me. You know, it's a, it's a neat practice and it's a fun place to work. Uh, but this emotionally kind of took it out of me. Yeah, it, uh, it did. I'm you know, sure it did. Add that on top of COVID and everything else that's mm -hmm. been going on. It's been a heck of a three-year run. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And um, this this contrast is pretty graphic. I think the audience will like watching this. Oh, I'm sick about it. I mean, they were great people to me and have continued to be. I mean. I mean, there's, there's no justification for my actions and I understand that. And I just. Yeah, some tears there. Now, um, Mark, Mark tells a little different story. Community that, that still believe her side of things that her husband was just this horrible person and that, uh, she tells them that, uh, she. Uh, would do it all over again if she was put in the same position. I mean, and that's something I've heard in the last six months. So, you know, that's the side of the story that she tells people. If she was very remorseful, she wouldn't, she wouldn't be spreading that story. You know, the items that were stolen were not items that you needed desperately to get away from your husband. I mean, like I said, three televisions, uh, you know, I think one would have probably sufficed to get by with, but uh, um, I don't think there's much remorse there. I think it's exactly what, uh, I think she got exactly what she wanted out of it. Again, there was no remorse until that document was handed over to law enforcement and it was presented to her, her criminal attorney. And he pretty much told her, Hey, 
<laughs> they got you. Uh, so you better be remorseful. So mm -hmm. that's when the remorse started happening. That was so well put, Mark. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, and I, and I feel like that's exactly, you know, I think that that tells the story right there. I mean, there's a lot more I could go into in detail. Like I said, uh, part of what she uh, stole was through purchases on through Amazon and uh, utilizing a company credit card uh, over a period of time. And we were able to go back and, and see the items that that were stolen. And they were not they were not items that uh, that, that you know you needed to survive. Uh, you know, there were frivolous things. Uh, a lot of them were gifts uh, that she sent to uh, another person that she uh, ended up uh, moving in with. So, um, you know, it, uh, it, it, it was just a very odd uh, list of things that she purchased. So my question is, you you had mentioned the the story that she's or that she was going around town telling was mainly about maybe the abusiveness of her husband or something like that. Yeah. Does the community um, that you live in are they aware that she's stolen from you and that she's been prosecuted for that? Number one. And number two, are you at liberty and do you feel comfortable discussing that with people in your community? I mean, everybody, like I said, it's a small town and everybody knows everybody's business. Uh, so if somebody asks me and really wants to know if it's something that, you know, isn't overly personal, I have no problem telling them the truth. I mean, I have nothing to hide. Um, uh, and again, that's a, you know, that's another point. I, I brought that up with a, a Amber the other day. Uh, you know, if you have nothing to hide, if there's nothing that you have done wrong, there, you really don't have a reason to not pursue prosecuting someone. Um, is it, is it fun to go through? No, but, uh, uh, you know, if you, if you, if you've done nothing wrong, it's, you know, you, you need to, to do the right thing. Absolutely. Well, this is what I described as the Alzheimer's slide. Let's uh, let's listen to all the things Miranda suddenly can't remember. The background and tell us about the first time uh, you took money from Cornerstone Family Dental. Um, to be honest, Amber, I really do not remember. I don't remember. So, so you, you're saying, Ms. Wolf, that that was your first embezzlement action? To what I remember, yes. Are you sure that you have really no memory of the first time you did this? I really do not. I, I do not. Okay. Can you give me um, when that first started to occur? No. You didn't buy anything else on the credit card? Not to my recollection, no. Is there a time that you didn't enter payments into the patient software and, and kept kept the cash or? I mean, not to my knowledge. You had administrative privileges in the software, right? Um, I believe I did. Do you have an estimate of the total amount that you took? I do not. I do not. So did you ever accept a, a cash payment from a patient? in your time at the, at the dental office where the patient pays you to apply to their account? I mean, I may have accepted the payment. And my basic thought here is liar, liar, pants on fire. Um, one, one thing I'll tell the audience that, that uh, those of us on the panel all know is that a lot of times when somebody says honestly, or I'm being honest with you, what comes out of their mouth next isn't actually honest. Uh, and and uh, Miranda did that at the beginning. Uh, but, you know, for somebody who um, seemed generally like she had her act together and was a bit of a control freak, her, her loss of memory in this interview was, was kind of startling. In fact, it was funny, and Amber will remember this, at one point her lawyer, who's, you can't see him, he's just off camera, 
Uh, but her lawyer who was with her actually kind of turned to her and said, nobody's going to believe that you can't remember this stuff. <laughs> um, you know, and I was asking her about her first theft there, and, and um, I'm, I'm going to use kind of a clumsy analogy. Uh, but for most thieves, your first theft is kind of like when you lose your virginity. Um, you know, all of us remember, you know, how that happened and, and, you know, what the weather was like that day. And here Miranda was saying, no, I, you know, I don't remember the first time I stole. Uh, so that's not very credible. Yeah. Well, and I, again, looking at this clip, uh, the face, facial cues. Yeah. Uh, are are so telling to me because I saw that look in her face and that little biting of the lip or the look away and look down and and say something and then close her eyes and bow her head you know and I'm sure she was lying to me you know now now it's easy to see but uh you know at the time didn't 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 see it you have the advantage of knowing her for a long time but my impression as we were interviewing her was exactly that. And, you know, the people who uh, study neuro-linguistic programming uh, talk a lot about, you know, what eye movement means in terms of truthfulness. And yeah, Miranda was giving off all the vibes of, of lying there. And of course, you know, she had the, the waterworks going and um, yeah, I, I, Amber and I after kind of compared notes and, and our basic conclusion was, uh, you know, this woman's neither, uh, she, she's not truthful and she is a manipulator. Yeah. Well, and I talked to uh, some of her, her former friends that she had come to uh, when this was first kind of, you know, there were, there were some gossip around town that something was going on. And, uh, and they said that she came and just cried her eyes out and told them this big story. And uh, one of them, after she left, just told them all that she was not truthful. She, you know, I won't use the words she used. Uh, and, uh, and then when they heard what had actually happened, they're like, they couldn't believe how good she was at, you know, just being able to start crying and, and, you know, spin this tale. And just like when you, you played the clip of the remorse, you know, she's, she's crying and she's, and her voice is quivering. And, and I think even at one point when you asked her if she wanted to add anything, she could quiver and, and you know these little these little things uh, is all fake. She she was unquestionably sorry, but I think she was sorry about getting caught as opposed to sorry she did it. Yeah, yeah. You know that's uh, the that's the differentiation. I, I think she was more concerned when she agreed to do the confession with us. Um, I, I think she really wanted to see if she could keep some of her credibility and continue this new path she she had from a career perspective. And um, I'll never forget this. She kept at first saying, well, how much have you found? And, you know, wanting to know a number. Remember that, Dave? She kept wanting to know realistically um, how much we had found and not going to disclose that to her because I think she thought if they're not smart enough to figure this out and it's a small enough amount, I can keep everything swept under the rug and Mark and, and your associate, your business partner, We'll just let it go and I can still stay on this path that I've created for myself. And I, I truly, in my heart of hearts, think that's the reason she uh, contacted you so much um, after she was no longer employed and, and wanted to speak with us because I think she really thought she could find a way to, to keep her credibility. Oh yeah, uh, she, she thought she could spin us. And uh, right. Amber once or twice said something very that, that, that I loved in the in the interview she said that's Miranda that's not consistent with the evidence that we have yeah and that just kind of rocked Miranda back and you know she um okay so you know these per, perhaps while I'm trying to play these guys they're actually playing me well and I think she was uh I think that's exactly what she went into it thinking I'm just gonna go fishing here and find out what I think they know and then I don't maybe have to confess to it all yeah. yeah. All right. Well, let's turn the let's turn the page because that to me was a, a a fascinating story about the embezzlement. But now let's turn this into helping people. And one of the questions that that uh, Amber Amber was was interviewing Mark for the the video you're seeing. Uh, one of the questions she asked is what what advice do you have for for the dental profession? I would not 
put all my trust in one person um, and uh, put put uh, checks and balances into your uh, system so that, uh, you know, you keep everybody uh, honest, so to speak, but it's more uh, just for your own peace of mind. Come up with your, own, you know, uh, come up with your own system to make sure that your your uh, due diligence is done and making sure that everybody is doing things the way they should be. Because if you don't, um, you're allowing somebody to an opportunity to, to take advantage. And some people just do not have the ability to say no, or they don't, they don't understand that uh, they think, oh, this isn't any big deal. And people can rationalize things, you know, um, and make it feel like, oh, well, this isn't that big a deal. And, and I earned that. He wouldn't have what he has if it wasn't for me. And, you know, those types of things. Uh, they weren't the ones staying up all night studying for that path test. Uh, so, um, but they think that they're the ones that, that, that are making you successful. So, but you do have to have some kind of a system. Uh, and, and, and if there's something that doesn't add up, investigate it. Don't let it, don't let it go. If I had to sum up the, the, the considerable wisdom that Mark just delivered, uh, I would say trust, but verify. Yep. Uh, which of course is, is quoting uh, President Reagan. Yep. <laughs> well, um, then Mark, the, the question I have is um, winding the clock back 10 years. I mean, let's, let's allow ourselves the time machine so that we can uh, go back 10 years and if if somebody had said to you we'll work with you we'll help you put the right controls in place um, yeah. is, is that something knowing what you know now that you wish you had done I, I wish I had done that um, of course uh, I I would have liked to uh, and you know I, I, I feel like if, again and I, I said it in the in the clip you should there needs to be a system and if you if you have a uh, uh, a way of doing it and doing it consistently uh, you know it's not really making work for you you're but you're you're doing what you should to keep keep everybody honest yeah yeah you know I I, I hate to say it but in the majority of practices that I see, the only reason that embezzlement doesn't happen is because employees choose to be honest when you know they could have made another choice. And to me, that's kind of Russian roulette. Um, you know, sooner or later, in the in the course of a 35-year career in dentistry, you're going to run into somebody who thinks they have a higher right to your money than you do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, Mark, again, I just want to really, really thank you um, for being with us tonight. Um, you know, I, I've been an investigator for almost 11 years now. So I do this on a daily basis. And every single time I find embezzlement, my stomach turns and I have a, a few choice words that I can't say in public that I say in private. Um, and still after 11 years, and this is what I do full time, Amber as well, I still feel sick. And I can't imagine honestly what it's like to be a business owner and that punch in the gut that you must have had when you first found out what was happening and then the amount of money that she stole. Um, I, I, I work with a lot of clients who have embezzlement confirmed and they all feel like some part of it was their fault. And we know that that is completely not true. This is something that is done to you and there is no excuse that it was done to you. It's not your fault. But what um, what I admire about you is your willingness to say, you know, number one, I don't want this to happen to anybody else in the profession that I love so dearly. 
So mm -hmm. I'm going to prosecute her to keep her out of other dental offices. Number one. Number two, your attitude of I'm going to share my story because I don't want this to happen to anybody else again. I want to keep her out of the office and I want to share my story and I want to let people know that it can happen to them just like it happened to me. And that I called you courageous in the beginning um, when I was talking about this webinar. And, and I believe that with all of my heart because mm -hmm. I mean, I've had clients when we confirm or when I confirm embezzlement that have, that have cried on the phone because they're just so broken over the loss of trust. And it's not even really the loss of money. It's the loss of trust. Right. And I, I kind of get the feeling that, that you might've been that way, even with Amber, where it just absolutely broke your heart. And I, I appreciate you having the courage to share your story with everyone else so that they can learn um, from what you've gone through so it won't happen to them. Well, it, uh, again, we, we didn't believe it. My wife and I, we didn't believe it when we first, you know, we, we kept thinking there's some kind of mistake, you know, there's some kind of mistake, but, uh, then the evidence just mounted and it was, so yeah, I mean, it, uh, it was, it was hard. It was very hard, hard on everybody. It wasn't just me. It was a lot of, a lot of people. Well, yeah, I, I think it's interesting um, that you added how hard it was on your staff as well. Well, and patients. I've had patients break down and cry. They didn't believe it in the mm -hmm. chair. They go, well, I just want to talk to you about this real quick. And Dr. Salad, I just want you to know I'm so sorry. You know, and they just break down and cry. They're like, we just never dreamed that she would do something like that. And she had an oak, her office was towards the front of the building, uh, the front of the lobby, and pe patients would just drop by to say hi. You know, they wanted to talk to her. She was that kind of a person. Mm -hmm. Everybody knew her. Wow. Yeah, Wendy's, Wendy's right about Mark being a real life hero. And, and yeah. I don't use that term lightly. And I, I remember very well that first phone call. So I was, uh, I was speaking at a conference in Dallas, I think. And, you know, I finished speaking and I checked my voicemail and there was a, there was a message from Mark and, um, you know, I, I called him back. He, he, he told a bit of that story in, in a video clip earlier. And my instant impression was, you know, this is a, this is a man of tremendous quality mm -hmm. and, you know, just the way he conducted himself and told the story. And yeah, obviously he was, he was hurting a bit at that point and, you know, he did all the right things for all the right reasons at, at, at every moment. And, you know, that was my initial impression and, and everything I've seen since really reinforced it. So, uh, Mark, we, we all thank you. And, and on behalf of the audience, uh, you know, who are um, putting in some, some nice comments as well, um, you know, thank you for doing this. What I'd like to do now, uh, while, while we're finishing up our group, group hug here, um, is uh, just... Uh, turn it over and take some of the questions that have been uh, piling up. And uh, Amber and Wendy, I think you guys have been keeping a little bit of an eye on the questions. Uh, what would you like to bring forward? And then we can kind of figure out who can best answer them. Well, I have I have kind of a compilation of, of questions and I, I can ask in, in maybe one question for um, maybe Amber um, okay. and maybe you too, Dave. Um, normally in prosperitant investigations, we are very covert about the investigation. We take a copy of the data. We don't talk to staff members. Um, we're very secretive about it because one of our main instructions is that we don't want the doctor or anyone else tipping off the suspect because there may be some ramifications to tipping off the suspect or there may be some data deletion or something to cover their tracks. Um, in this case, Amber, that you did with Mark, it is. it sounds like it's way outside of the purview of how we usually handle an investigation. Um, we've had quite a few questions about that. Can you explain why this investigation was different than how we normally do it? Well, I think one of the main things is when we collected the data and set up our remote um, system, our, our clone of the da data, 
she was already gone and had been gone for a while. Um, so I think there was that was one of the main reasons um, <laughs> that the staff, uh, particularly one of the, there was a key team member who was a former hygienist and also did a lot of business things um, there. So she was made aware of what was going on because there was times that I would need reports that were outside of EagleSoft um, for, for other things. Um, so I think from my perspective, she had been got long gone for several months before Prosperident was contacted. Um, because Mark and his business partner, like we, we just talked about, they already went to the police, they talked to their accountant. You know, they, they tried to go down some paths to figure some things out prior to calling us. Um, and because it was a small community, I mean, she knew the purpose and the reason why she was terminated. I mean, I remember our first conversation that Mark told me, you know, our first thing we, we figured out that, you know, her compensation wasn't what it was supposed to be. And, you know, we terminated her. So I think there was just a lot of knowledge in the community, small, small community, and, and she was aware of what was going on. Um, okay. okay. And then Mark, when when you separated employment from her, um, did did you fire her or did she quit? And that was actually her? that was actually one of I feel like one of the smarter things we did. Um, we had her come down to a different office than her office, and while we had her down there, we we had uh, another employee with us. And we had another employee at her office, not not going through her things or anything, just right there. And uh, uh, we brought her in. And basically, I didn't want to hear any excuses. I mean, I already knew what was going on. And I just told her that that she was being terminated because she we had lost trust in her. And that, that was important in the position we had her in. And uh, she left. Uh, and we didn't let her get back on the computer. We didn't allow her access to any office materials. Uh, we just let her go in and get her personal affairs. And she already had her computer up and we were able to immediately go into her computer. She had saved passwords. We were able to download Amazon. We were able to, we found an awful lot of material that we wouldn't have found had she had access back on that computer mm -hmm. after she knew she was terminated. Great, Th that's such valuable information. Thank you so much. And just absolutely textbook. That is exactly the advice yeah. we would give somebody. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah definitely. Uh, so, Mark, I have a question for you, because okay. you did contact the police, and, and a member of our audience uh, wants your experience, but in their experience, because they've had embezzlement occur, they said that they feel like the police generally are not interested in, in this type of scenario. Well, um, I would say in a larger community, that's probably probably true. Uh, I, in our in our case uh I, I don't i don't want to make fun of our police because they're great and and i, I respect them a great deal mm -hmm. but uh it was almost a little bit like they got excited because they don't have this kind of dollar amount you know that you know they're used to somebody having a car stolen or uh or you know uh something like that uh you know six digit plus uh cases uh, so they kind of got excited about it a little bit, but I think, I, I just think it was overwhelming to them because they, like I said before, they didn't have the expertise to, to really go through this. And, uh, um, you know, we might've been able to get the accountant to hire somebody to, but by the time we trained the, the people to use the software, or we hired somebody to go with the accountant to help them Put it together they never would have got it together in a precise manner like this like this report was uh the report was like i said it was when i handed that to the to investigator his eyes lit up he was all excited because he knew he had what he needed to to do something with it uh and and then at that point forward i was i, I was a little disappointed on how some of the how it all uh, happened she never was officially arrested uh, she, again, I feel like she manipulated uh, things. Uh, she was able to have a meeting with her attorney and the police, and the police uh, didn't, didn't arrest her. 
uh, she was finally arraigned, but it was just kind of a, a you know, a, just the process to, to get the ball rolling, so to speak. But it wasn't, she never, she never even spent a minute in a cell or anything like that. It wasn't, uh, uh, I mean, she did go in and have her mugshot. Now, that was on the, on the uh, uh, television uh, report that he showed earlier. But other than that, um, there was no, no, nothing like you would think would happen to somebody had stolen, you know, six digit plus. Uh, I, I always joked about it. Uh, I said, you know, if they, if she had stolen a truck or a car, they would have arrested her and put her in jail. Uh, but in this case, she, she, it was like she stole the truck, but she was selling pieces of it to help pay for her uh, lawyer to, to fight it. So um, it was, it was just very odd how it, how it happened. Interesting. Thank you. Um, we have a few kind of double back questions here. Um, two questions. Someone um, did not hear how much she inflated her own pay. That's the first question. And then someone else also asked about, um, can you repeat what the total theft amount was? Uh, well, let me just back up just a little bit. We, she, her, her base pay was, you know, 57 or 60,000. And, uh, she would get a bonus based on, um, collections quarterly. And we had a formula that we went through to calculate that and how it was supposed to happen was she was supposed to have a meeting with one of the doctors. If we both weren't present, a lot of times, both of us were present and we'd go through the figures and we'd go through the formula together. And then we would sign, one of us would sign a check, a, a you know, a regular check uh, would have our signature on it. Well, she had access to direct deposits and uh, she had access to, uh, you know, she gathered everybody's information for payroll. Uh, and we had a payroll uh, company that did our payroll for us, but uh, she started having them give her an additional bonus that obviously hadn't been worked through the formula was not in the form of a check that uh, uh, we both had signed. So it, it just kind of slipped under the radar. And I, I, you know, the exact, the total amount was, you know, 140,000, but with recovery costs and everything, the total uh, judgment that we got was for 154,000. Okay, uh, so, so you recovered. Question. I think so. So you recovered the cost of um, or your losses due to that. You recovered those Correct. as well as the amount lost. Correct. That's all that is. I think 27,000. She, she had three felonies uh, because she stole three different ways. She stole uh, 27,000 uh, by using the office credit card and, and it would be considered wire fraud because she was uh, purchasing items on Amazon and shipping them across a state line too. So that was another another uh, little point there. And then the other was she was taking money uh, from deposits. She was the only person that uh, was making the deposit. She had actually changed a system that we had and we didn't know it. Uh, uh, she was going in and depositing the money herself and she was siphoning some cash off of that and uh, then the inflated uh, salary and and uh i'm gonna I, and you guys may need to help me because i don't remember it it's been a while since i've looked at the at the breakdown but um 27 000 and somewhere around forty thousand, i think uh cash uh that's maybe it was All right yeah so uh, then so she elevated her, her salary somewhere around 70,000. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's just shocking. Yeah. So and, the, Amber, they, 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 we usually say there are almost always at least three theft methodologies. And mm -hmm. that's kind of what Mark has, has said about the three. Were, were there three or were there more? Were there other theft methodologies that were just kind of not? No, I, we, we thought at one point 
that she, and we feel pretty strongly that she took cash from some patients and didn't make documentation in, in the software. Um, but we, we didn't feel like that was some, another way we should pursue because it would, it would, it just muddied the water. Uh, and I think maybe it was you, Dave, that, that said that, that, uh, you know, we, we can pursue that. We can, you know, we can get witness statements. We can uh, do a bunch of things, but if, if, if somehow they can prove one of them didn't happen, it kind of takes away from the, the, the three methods that we had solid proof on. So we, we didn't do that. Um, and, and when we say three, the, the, the important factor for me that there was three different ways is a felony is, is anything over 25,000. So she had three felonies. She didn't just, she just, she didn't, you know, get in trouble one time. And she had three different separate incidences that she, that, that, that were charges that were brought against her. Now she plead out to where she just has one. But if she doesn't pay us back, all three will come back on her record. Interesting. It's good information. Wow. All right. Well, folks, we're uh, we're at or a little beyond our, our, our time for tonight. Um, so just a couple of things before we wrap up. First of all, if you uh, if you enjoyed tonight, we would love you forever if you'd leave us a five star Google review and the easiest way to do it is just go to that link that's right on our page, prosperidentcom slash review us. Um, also a reminder that we will be back uh, in a little bit less than a month where we're going to have uh, my friend Emmett Scott talking about the DSO world. And uh, it's a great chance to learn about that part of dentistry. And, you know, we all know that the DSOs are growing rapidly and swallowing up practices. So uh, there's information there that every practice owner probably needs. Um, I would like to thank uh, our, our co-hosts for tonight and, and always uh, Wendy Askins and Amber Weber Gonzalez on camera, uh, Sheila O'Driscoll, who's really the executive producer of, of our webinar series behind the scenes. And of course, our, our special and uh, we, we used adjectives like courageous and heroic guests, uh, Dr. Mark Salad and Mark, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, and we look forward to seeing all of you in a little less than a month. Wendy, I'm talking on your slide. What what else? Oh, go right what, ahead. Sorry, just got on a roll here. Yeah, go right ahead. Um, there are the places where you can reach us, and we look forward to seeing you in less than a month. This concludes this episode of the Prosperident webinar series. The team will be back soon with more tools and ideas. If you have questions about this webinar, if you would like to discuss your practice with one of us, or if there is a topic you would like to see in a future webinar, we would love to hear from you. You can contact Prosperident through its website, www.prosperident.com, or by calling 888-398-2327.